Hi, everybody. I hope you're well. Uh, today, we'll read from a book titled Pictures from Home by Larry Salton, published by Mac. The house is quiet. They have gone to bed, leaving me alone, and the electric timer has just switched off the living room lights. It feels like the house has settled in and finally turned on its side to fall asleep. Years ago, I would have gone through my mother's purse for one of her cigarettes and smoked in the dark. It was a magical time that the house was mine. Tonight, however, I'm restless. I sit at the dining room table, rummage through the refrigerator. What am I looking for? All day I have been scavenging, poking around in rooms and closets, peering at their things, studying them. I arrange my rolls of exposed film into long rows and count and recount them as if they were loot. There are 28. I can hear my mother snoring through the closed bedroom door. Without my asking, she has left a Valium tablet for me. It is sitting on the bathroom counter next to a full glass of water. I don't sleep well here. The pillow is too high and spongy, the sheets polyester, the blanket too thin. I wake up in the middle of the night filled with the confusion of motels. This is not my house. The house where I grew up was sold long ago. Of the three houses that they have lived in since they moved to California from Brooklyn, this one, with its 20-foot cathedral ceilings and Italian tile floor, is the least alive for me. At the same time, it seems to have a life of its own. The radio turns itself on in the morning with the sprinklers. The lights go on in the evening and turn themselves off at 11. Everything is under control. Sitting finally on the couch in the dark living room, I begin to sink. I feel chills moving up my back and along my arms. I become sensitive to night sounds. The steering of the dog, the refrigerator, a neighbor's car and automatic garage door, my parents in their bedroom. My body seems to grow smaller, as if it is finally adjusting itself to the age I feel whenever I am in their house. It's like I am releasing the air from an inflatable image and shrinking back down to an essential form. Is this why I've come here? To find myself by photographing them? Every few months I visit, loaded down with camera gear and ideas for pictures. It takes a day or two for most of these ideas to seem strained or foolish. And then I'm left with cases of unexposed film and a feeling of desperation. I bargain with my father, trading him hours of weeding in his garden for minutes of his time posing for me. When I finally begin to photograph him, I feel so anxious that I retake the same pictures I made years ago. After a few days of this, I become so distracted that I miss most of the wonderful daily things and instead I begin to act like an anthropologist or a cop, photographing shoes, papers, the surfaces of dressers, evidence. It's only when I give up trying to make pictures and begin to enjoy the time spent with them that anything of value ever happens. The other day my father asked me, what do you do with all those pictures that you make? You must have thousands of them by now. When he takes pictures, he has the entire roll printed and keeps all of the 3x5 inch prints in envelopes that one day he plans to put into albums. A few years ago, he presented me and my two brothers with scrapbooks filled with pictures that he had made of us over the years. I tell him that most of my photographs aren't very interesting and so I just file the negatives away in boxes. He can't believe it. You shoot 30 rolls of film to get one or two pictures that you like. Doesn't that worry you? He has a knack for finding the sore spot. No, I love making pictures, even if most of the results are lousy. The real issue is that many of the pictures that I do like trouble me more than all the ones that are filed away. 
I worry that they will trouble him as well. I remember arguing with him over 15 years ago about a photograph I made of my mother. It was a very simple and direct picture of her standing in front of a sliding glass door holding a cooked turkey in a silver platter. He accused me of creating an image that had less to do with her than with my own stereotypes of how people age. I argued that our conflicting notions about who mom is and how she should be represented are based on our different relationships to her. She is my mother, but his wife. I pointed out that in almost every picture of her that he has taken, she is posed like a model, selling one thing or another. Look, I said, I don't see her in that way. I don't glamorize her with my photographs, and that's why you claim that the pictures undermine her vitality. It's your image of her vitality that they counter. All I know is that you have some stake in making us look older and more despairing than we really feel, he answers. I really don't know what you are trying to get at. I can remember when I first conceived of this project. It was in 1982 and I was in Los Angeles visiting my parents. One night, instead of renting a videotape, we pulled out the box of home movies that none of us had seen in years. Sitting in the living room, we watched 30 years of folk tales, epic celebrations of the family. They were remarkable, more like a record of hopes and fantasies than of actual events. It was as if my parents had projected their dreams onto film emulsion. I was in my mid-thirties and longing for the intimacy, security and comfort that I associated with home. But whose home? Which version of the family? When I began to photograph, I thought of this work as a portrait of my father. In many ways, I still do. I can remember the peculiar feeling I had looking at the first pictures that I made of him. I was recreating him and, like a parent with an infant, I had the power to observe him knowing that I would not be observed myself. Photographing my father became a way of confronting my confusion about what it is to be a man in this culture. Unaware of deeper impulses, I convinced myself that I wanted to show what happens when, as I interpreted my father's fate, corporations discard their no longer young employees, and how the resulting frustrations and feelings of powerlessness find their way into family relations. These were the Reagan years when the image and the institution of the family were being used as an inspirational symbol for resurgent conservatives. I wanted to puncture this mythology of the family and to show what happens when we are driven by images of success. And I was willing to use my family to prove a point. The book was originally published in 1992 by Harry Abrams, uh, Aspirate at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.